Hey. Hey, Joe. Oh, sorry. Was that to us? Sorry. I, was, I don't know if that was to the audience or whether that's, that was to us. Hello. That's us. Good chat. From the audience. Hey, Joe. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, really good actually. Good, good. Uh, yeah, the sun's shining. What, what could be, what could be worse? Eh? I know. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. Um, so we're just introducing you to Simon, who I say is my, my glamorous co-host. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I thought that was more you, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> Make a good tea. And we're talking all around well-being and performance. And when we're thinking about performance, Steve, you are the perfect person for us to, to chat to today. Um, but I wondered if you could do it for anybody that doesn't know you. I mean, everybody should know who you are, but maybe you could do it. I never assumed, as a 50-something-year-old middle-aged person, I never assumed that. You, you, you might have a very good memory in some black and white flickery video from the from the from the late nineties, but um, yeah, we, maybe we should do something of an introduction. Um, shall I do that, or do you want to do that? Oh, I'm lucky. To, you tell tell us about your as a, you know your Olympic journey and to where you are now. Well, yeah. Look, I, I won't go on too much, but in a nutshell, I was a track and field athlete. I competed. Um, oh goodness! I started as my first sort of senior year was 1989. I was, I went straight from being a junior athlete to being ranked world number one. Broke the world record the following year. So I had a, this sort of amazing, you know, meteoric rise to the top of the sport. But then spent the next 15 years trying to hang on to that level of of, uh, of performance. So. Look, I've always um, been fascinated by performance in a wider context. Um, had the pleasure of going to four Olympic Games, working with some of the greatest um, specialists from, you know, different support services around sport that apply to, to life beyond sport. And I, I suppose that's where my fascination and passion lies in retirement post 2004 when I went to my last Olympics is in performance in its in its wider context and, and how to help other people learn from you know what what I learned you know in doing it well so in the mistakes I made and, and, and what went right and wrong throughout that decade or so 15 years maybe of competing at the top so um, yeah I was a javelin thrower um, doesn't really matter on the event that was just a vehicle that took me to my, my passion which was all about the Olympic Games if I'm honest so um, yeah good, good fun while it lasted but it comes to an end and, and like I say now, I work in the field of performance with my colleague, Roger Black. And um, yeah, we, we, we help individuals and teams and organizations to help their team, to help their individuals, help them with their clarity, with their passions, with their confidence, with their well-being. Um, and, and, you know, we do it in typically in a room. But as, as ever, we've all moved online. We're all on Zoom now. And uh, so, so here we are. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's such a great introduction. And I remember, you, well, you came to see us, I think, when you came out for the, uh, was it the Athens Olympics? Was that 2004 when you were out with Richard? And when you come out of your final Olympics and you think, right, what's that transition look like from being, an, you know, once an Olympian, always an Olympian? But then how do you then decide, right, I'm going to go into business now? Yeah, it's a, it's a fortunate position but in some ways but in other ways a tricky one because you know you're mid-30s typically as a retired sportsman certainly in athletics that's the case maybe longer in some sports you know younger in, in others but you know you finish at an age where you clearly have time to start a new career but have turned your back on you know industry or you know colleagues friends who you know went on to build businesses and you know city traders and professionals in different walks of life and you you look at them and think okay well i'm not going to catch up so um from a professional point of view necessarily um or maybe that was possible i don't know but here i am sort of 15 years on as many years retired as i did competing uh, and i'm still I'm still asking myself that question actually to be honest with you joe <laughs> but actually no the truth is um i've massively believe in in being multifaceted having multiple sources of income makes you more stable. I think we've really felt that in the last year or so, um, you know, having one profession and being in one, you know, very narrow em employment makes you quite vulnerable actually. And I think that's possibly one of the transitions and one of the changes we'll see going forward. We know that, you know, the employed world will be more transient, it'll be more fluid. Um, and, and, you know, with that comes challenges and opportunity. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, can you remember how you met my brother, Richard? <laughs> I can, so of course I can. Um, <laughs> no, Richard and I go, go back many, many years uh, on the golf course initially. Um, I remember down, down at a golf course in Kent called Motelands that uh, is no longer uh, a golf course, unfortunately, but uh, it was a very, uh, very pleasant place to be. And I regularly see Richard there from a distance, knowing that he was the ex-England schoolboy golfer, thinking, oh, goodness, he's got to be good. And, I, and then I heard somebody say, um, oh, God, don't, don't play with Richard. He takes it far too seriously. You know, and I thought, I like him already. I like him already. I want to play golf with him. And uh, do you know what, Richard, and, 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 and I, this applies, so I suppose, to, to yourself as well, Joe. I think, you know, the thing with Active Digital and being involved in your, your journey, uh, it's been such a pleasure because of your your passion for performance as well. I, th I almost feel like you have a, a an Olympic attitude to your business. You know, you're you're always looking to optimize. You you care. You, it's personal. It's you 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 know you you. It's very hands on. Even though you run the business, you're 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 in, you work in the business and on the business, and and it's a, it's a performance environment where you you know you've been creative and flexible. No, you know, in the last year, probably you know, it's a good example of that. So I, I, I felt right at home from the get go, and and it's good to be here with you here. You know, all these years later, twenty years later, in fact, is it? Something I know, like I know. No, we love having you as a company ambassador, and and you're right. You know, when I think about my brother, and both of us think we're we're fiercely competitive, but so motivated to want to do well in whatever we're doing, whether it's together as a business or or you know some of our own projects and. My brother on his WhatsApp, it always makes you smile every day because you know how you can change the text at the top of your WhatsApp. He's, he's flat out today, ready for tomorrow. And that is so Richard, isn't it? Because he he's full pedal down or full pedal off. He doesn't have um, an in-between. Mm. And, and for me, you know, I do, I get up every day and I'm so motivated to want to, to want to do well. And I think, like you say, mindset is is everything, isn't it? I'm, I know you see that yeah. as well, Simon. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think it's um I mean, it's, it's, it's an honour to talk to you, Steve, actually, as, a, as an oh, Olympian, you. I have to say. Um, I've had the pleasure of working in Formula One and worked with uh, nine Formula One drivers um, during my 14 years at McLaren. And uh, I've seen, seen, you know, the kind of competitive nature of athletes, but also that mindset where you're so driven uh, and, and confident in what you do that that can apply really well in business. But one of the significant things that I've experienced this year more than anything is the power of uh, relationships in business and building, building a network of relationships. And obviously your time working with Active Digital has evolved over 20 years. And I just wonder if you could share a little bit about you know, what you enjoy about it and, and, how, and how that has evolved. Yeah, look, it's, it's, um, it's evolved in a, in a sense that um, you, know, you guys... Joe Richard, the, the team has clearly grown, um, but but the what I love about it is the ethics and the you know the the values remain the same. Um, and and what I what I particularly like is the forward thinking nature of the business. You know, I think that's what sports people do. Um, I think it's what successful people do in all walks of life. Is they the only time the only thing you can change is the, is is the present. Um, and that affects the future and, and we're all in control of our own futures and what we think what we feel and what we do um, and you know that's that's absolutely if you, you know, if you lose sight of that as a sportsman if you dwell on you know you, something that's bad or something in the past you you stand still and um, there's one you know the, the only place you stand still or if you stand still is, is, is you go is you go backwards um, so that's what I you know active digital is what I love about um, the company, the, the individuals, the dynamic, and the the, uh, the culture within the organisation is that is, is a forward thinking one, and um, I think that's a very healthy place to be. I think we're so lucky being in tech as well because we can't stand still. You know, it's, it's ever evolving. I think we're so fortunate that we are in an industry that is just constantly changing, and you know, and I think that's really exciting for our employees as well because they could be selling a new product next week that, that's, that's just come to market and it is just for, yeah, ever evolving. Yeah, I mean, when you think of the technology that's evolved whilst you've done what you do so well, you know, you look back at the technology itself, like the physical handsets that you would have sold in the early 2000s or, you know, late 90s, whenever it was it first started, you know, it's just, a, it's, it's just amazing, really, the transformation in what's possible. 
um and i think that's that's uh, that's the only thing that really limits people is is the appreciation of what is possible of what we're capable of uh, and, and that's part of what i you know try to and like to help people with and again where that fit comes in is if we believe that anything's possible then it's a good you know it's a good place to start right absolutely absolutely so Steve, you know, tell us how has the last 12 months been for you? I know we've spoken on a couple of occasions and considering, you know, you are used to standing on a podium and, and delivering talks, um, which you've been doing for, you know, probably over 20 years now, as well as being in a room doing your workshops with, with, with Roger on, on performance and leadership. And all of a sudden, all of that's taken away from you. Yeah, and, and that that was a wrench. I, I, I'm not going to lie, that was that was tough because we we love being in a room. We love the um, you know just from a personal indulgence point of view, if I may, you know, just that whole thing of standing on a stage and and engaging with an audience and interacting with people as you know as lovely as this is, guys. You know, it's it, you know, I look forward to being in a room together. You know, just to breathe the same air and and you just get you get you know more out of it. Um, that said this is incredibly efficient in terms of its reach. So there's pros and cons, but to put it all honesty, the events world came to a grinding halt. I mean, we, we've done a scattering of, of events. Um, you know, I could probably count them on, on, on two hands, certainly over the last year in terms of actual, you know, motivational presentations down, down the camera. I, I, I haven't done many. Um, that, that said, we have, reinvented ourselves somewhat because we have a, a digital service now where we we, um, we we have a much more scalable proposition by productizing and, and having a, a you know a video uh, database which people can access for for help in, in in different areas so you know we're trying to use technology maybe learning from and, and being being creative and being flexible um and be and you know in, in the knowledge that events will come back and they may you know may even come back with a vengeance because i think there's a real hunger a real thirst for you know being in a room and the challenges that we've all faced to be able to share them acknowledge them first of all you know where are we are we okay and and be able to look each other in the eye and and really empathize and appreciate the challenges we've all faced because we've all kind of we've all done this slightly differently i guess um, whilst we've all been forced on online and, and felt similar feelings we don't really know and I think that's the one thing you get from a room is that intimacy and that ability to really flick over every stone to gain the the, the full awareness that we that we all know is important in in a performance journey um so so yeah look forward to that coming back but for now it's been slow it's been <laughs> it's been a, a battle but the, the the change in direction and I think that there's a, there's almost a lesson in that you know when things change, we have to change with them. Um, if we if we fight and say no, I'm going to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, we all know what that is. that's the definition of. So being able to 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 step back, assess well, what is possible, and and then rebuild, is uh, is part of a winning mindset, I guess. No, definitely. I'm trying to think what that saying is, Steve. It's that you can't change the wind, adjust your sails, or, or something along along those lines, and. It's, it's probably been the same for you then, Simon. If you're training people, you're used to training people, especially if they're, you know, they're drivers, you're used to having them in front of you while you're, you know, telling them what their techniques are and what they need to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to adapt to a more remote way of working. So I actually look after a driver um, over in Holland who I've never met and I've been training him for a year and uh, he's made significant changes over that period to his athleticism. So I always, always believe that you have to build a foundation, a base first. So you build that stability and robustness of the body before you layer up that intensity. And, and that's the ethos that I've used with all drivers that I've worked with, um, progressing them from sort of grassroots um, all the way up to Formula One uh, to endure the sort of, you know, uh, constraints, physi physiological constraints on their body. Um, and I think, I think for me, I was just going to say a little bit about working with Active Digital is that I think uh, as, as an Olympian like yourself, Steve, and as somebody, a coach who works, who works with drivers and, and athletes at a high level, um, is, is using that performance model to help other people in business and to help the office worker who sits all day long on their computer 
um, optimize their performance doing that, whether it's sort of giving them more breaks uh, so they can go out for walks, whether it's actually recommending they sort of move on a regular basis and then giving them the insight and exercises to doing things like that as part of this wellbeing program that we're doing. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, what significance do you feel and how important it is for companies to address wellbeing of their employees? Yeah, look, I, I think it's probably, it was, it was massively important pre-COVID. I think it's gone off the chart of its, with its importance during COVID because of the challenges so many people face. I think what's been unusual for um, some people, um, and, and, and it's, it, I think, you know, people have gone in various directions, but for some people, they've been able to perform and do their job quite admirably online and go to Zoom and do the, what they do, but the cost is quite, quite high um, because, the, the, you know, the maybe working from home, um, or, you know, naturally would have been working from home, uh, wouldn't have had the breaks, wouldn't have had the, the natural flow of being in your home when you're relaxing and away from your home when you're working. So that, that simple thing of being able to divide your time and understand when I'm switching on for work and when I'm able to switch off and recover and recuperate, you know, those simple patterns of, you know, behaviours that we maybe became routine and habit for, mo for most of us um, were gone. And I think there was a cost to that. So I think, you know, well-being going forward is essential, but I also see it as maybe as a bit of a, a sticking plaster on, on, on the problem. Um, because if we just, you know, look for a simple solution of, well, okay, we need more time as a break, we'll give a bit more time to, to have some time off or whatever it is and more, you know, it's almost just covering up. I think what, what the way I've sort of come about this is we, we talk a lot about getting ready. And I think it's the biggest challenge. It'd be interesting to get your thoughts on this, Simon, about them, um, you know, getting a sports person where you have a very luxurious position. We used to spend eight months of the year getting ready, competing for three months and then having a month off. You know, you know, you can't compare that to everyday life. People don't, you know, we don't, we spend very little time getting ready. We, we tackle problems having not practiced them, <laughs> you know, which sounds, you know, as a sports person, it's laughable. You know, would you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go into an arena under pressure and do something you'd never tried before. You'd, you'd fail a few times, learn from some mistakes, um, build a performance, visualize it, re, you know, cement it in your, in your mind's eye, pressure test it, you know, whatever, whatever the process might be, along with all the physical stuff that goes with that, um, over months and months and months, and then go out and, and, and perform. And then obviously you can hit, reach, reach a high level. And, the con conversely to that, of course, we're all asked to just cope, you know, whatever the world throws at you is deal with it. So, you know, my, my thinking is, is, is if we can help people to get ready for what stuff face and, not, and they're armed with the tools that are required to, to, to not only cope, but thrive, um, that then we're in a much better place. So I know, how did that, how did that sound to you, Simon? Is that, is that, is that a sort of language that you would use or? Oh yeah, undoubtedly. Yeah, I mean, coming uh, as as you coming from an athlete perspective and a coach, that's exactly the sort of language I use in terms of that uh, preparation, performance, or perform, review, and then recover. So you go through that process. The drivers, I take drivers through that process, so they understand that preparation is the key to success, and the performance part is almost a smaller part of the actual uh, process. Uh, and gives you that outcome. And then you need to review uh, of, of the sort of, uh, people call it failures, but I call it sort of a positive reflection on things that you can improve. <laughs> um, so sort of areas that you can improve. And I think failure is the ultimate way to learn how to improve. Um, and we rarely review success as well. And I think people need to prepare every day by setting themselves sort of daily goals as we, as we set on the Get Active program is that there's three, three sort of uh, goals that you set yourself each day in your personal life and your health and your work. Even if you choose even one goal though, over a year, that's 365 or even a thousand goals a year that you're achieving. Uh, and it might be something simple like, you know, just sipping an extra glass of water a day or whatever it is. It's all of that adds up over time. So your performance um, is improved. And um, so you can optimize yourself and then you can recover effectively. But I always say to the drivers as well that the process is more important than the outcome. 
um, and never focus on the outcome, focus on the process. And I think people are sometimes a bit guilty of going through this robotic way of working every day. They get up, same breakfast, they go to work, have a cup of coffee, they sit there all day long, don't move very much. They have their usual sort of lunch. They have the same thing every day. And then they go home and go through the same process. But I think if you start to reflect and look at how you can improve your well-being within that process, um, you can start over time to adapt to a, a much healthier, more positive way of working. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that's, um, that's, that sounds you know, utopia to me. That's, you know, I suppose the challenge that, um, that we face, it's easy and we're all, we're all guilty of this, of, of performing out of habit. And I understand, you know, more than half of what we do on an everyday basis, or even the thoughts that we have are the same as we had yesterday. And, and it's breaking those habits is what you're saying with small steps, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and giving them the tools um, so they can create uh, sort of more positive habits in their life that work for them as an individual, because obviously we're all different and we all need to realize that, that what, what works for someone may not work for someone else in the same scenario. So it's really adopting those good habits. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think half the battle as well is, you know, the whole principle of, they call it, you know, delayed gratification and taking small steps towards a, a, a bigger goal is, is easy in sport because we're given a, a finish line, you're given a rostrum, I get a bottle of champagne sprayed in your face if you're an F1 driver. We didn't get that in athletics. I always felt a bit left out, but you have that kind of moment of celebration at the end of a journey, right? And I think we we miss that sometimes in in business. I know Active are very keen on this, and it's been great to be part of your your rostrum moments, Joe. You know your celebrations along the way, um, but having that kind of lines in the sand of you know I'm this is where I am. This is where I want to be. Present the gap. And, and then go about those stepping stones, those marginal gains uh, to fill that gap is you know, that, that that's a, a fairly simple principle. I think everyone understands theoretically. Um, and I think what that comes down to then is a level of awareness. If, I, if I'm sort of interpreting what you're saying correctly, Simon, you know, that level of awareness to know where you are on that process and what habits I'm adopting that are helping me. And what habits I'm adopting that are counter to me moving down and, and, and filling that gap. Um, and, and a part of what we were fortunate and, and a luxurious position as an athlete was spending time with specialists to reflect and go, right, where truly are we? Not where we think we are, not where we hope to be we are, but where truly are we? And being brutally honest, you know, warts and all, if there's any fears, anxieties, anything, any lingering bits, you're better off obviously you know exposing it in the moment and then dealing with it then pushing it to one side and hoping it will go away so dealing with stuff along the way and then taking those tiny steps uh, over time is is massively important but and I suppose what we're saying as well from a business point of view looking flipping it around the other way it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on this Joe is you know we as I said in sport the number one rule is don't get injured and I suppose the equivalent in business is keep everyone well and healthy and you know with on the tools if everyone's on the tools every day optimistic and pushing forward the the, the organization thrives so how, how does how does what we've just been saying translate into into what you do well i was just thinking with business you can think of look at it from a two-prong effect really firstly i think the pandemic has given us an opportunity really to actually pause and reflect on how far we've come and you might do that as an athlete to think you know what i need to think about how how hard i've worked to, to get to this point but equally, what does the future look like? And, and taking those moments of reflection to think, you know, what does 2025 look like for Active Digital? And when I think that far ahead, I find it quite overwhelming, but Rich is often very much in the future and always, always planning ahead, which is probably why we make a good team. Um, but, you know, but throughout this business, one of the things that I think has been really good for me is I was chatting to O2 a little while ago, actually on the phone, and, and actually you're always trying to do better. So I think we often beat ourselves up. What could we have done more? What more could we have done? And, and this guy at O2, as I, I was chatting on the phone, he said, Joe, you know, you guys have one, been one of our most interactive partners. Uh, you know, you, you come on calls. He goes, a lot of people don't, don't turn up because actually burying your head in your sand is sometimes what you want to do. Um, and then we got awarded, you know, sort of top three partner of the year uh, and the awards last week. And and they gave us some feedback that they felt actually so much resilience is built and shown through, through the hard times. 
and we are the number one partner in the UK for uh, keeping the majority of our customers. So we kept more of our customers in the last 12 months than any other partner across the UK. And that always gives me goosebumps. You know, our team works so hard because actually getting new business is hard enough, but keeping hold of everything that you already have. We needed to hold our customers really tight and say, we're here for you. You know, anything you need technology wise, we're going to make sure we look after you. We're going to we're going to get your account running as efficiently as possible. Yes, we want to do that. Even, you know, if we really were in a pandemic, we, we, we're always known for doing well. But we kept them really, really close. And, uh, and and we've been praised for that. So it's nice to know that people cool. people are always watching. Yes. Yeah, that's a, 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 well, there's a I guess a sporting context there and you know we're, we're if we're at our best when people are watching we'll do okay right it's, uh, <laughs> i think that's one of the challenges that um you know that dealing with pressure i think we haven't really touched on that as a concept but i uh, i'm interested to know simon what, in, in terms of the balance and and how what we're talking about in in terms of um you know sport i think one of the things that i, I often think you know in translating what I learned from sport and the people I was very fortunate to work with, it's quite extreme. Um, it's quite intense. You know, you're striving to be the best in the world when in reality, you know, we don't need to maybe push ourselves that hard because there's a cost to that in terms of other stuff going on in our lives. Um, it's much more, what, what the world is much more compromised, I guess. But what strikes me is the challenge of balance. Mm. And I think the challenge of balance now or maybe it will change soon as 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 the lockdown releases and we, we you know we, we return to some more something more like normality pre-covid but how does balance what what do you think when you hear that word in terms of how people are facing the challenges of, of what covid's presented yeah that's a great question and i think it comes back to that that sort of review and reflection you know, and, and trying to pull out the positives of, and the negatives of going through that experience and what can you learn from those, what you deem as negatives um, and what can you learn obviously from the positives to help you tran transition from this sort of lockdown period as we call it um, into uh, the sort of more normal way of society working, uh, whatever normal is, um, it's gonna be a different normal um, as it were, but I think in a good way, in a positive way, I think businesses are learning that well-being is, is crucial to their success and their longevity. Uh, maybe businesses in general, in, in some cases, may have uh, taken that for granted um, in some ways. And I think as human beings, it's quite easy to take life for granted. And hopefully people can reflect on that, um, as we just discussed, and find that balance for themselves. So as individuals, we can find balance within our nutrition, uh, within adopting a more physical uh, way of being. So going out for walks regularly, we don't have to be an Olympic athlete and, and go through that rigmarole of training and, and sort of, you know, six days a week, morning and afternoon, and sort of having your naps in the afternoon, recovering, and then optimizing your recovery through sleeping strategies, et cetera. All of that is, is very kind of high level. But I still think we can learn a lot from that process uh, from, from athletes, especially and especially Olympic athletes who are at the top of their game um, to actually help people and guide them to find their own balance. Uh, and I think, I think that's a really important part of what we're doing as part of the Get Active program and being lucky enough to speak to somebody like yourself uh, through that process. Yeah, that's cool. I, I think the, the, other, the other aspect is, is clarity. Um, and we bang on a lot about clarity and you've sort of touched on it there with your, your, your three goal approach. Um, I, I'm quite, I'm quite hard in this. I'm sort of quite gentle with other stuff, but I don't, I actually go so far as I say, I don't think anyone's got enough clarity, anyone. Um, and I say that quite sort of, sort of categorically because the world changes from, from a second to second basis. So we can't, it's impossible to have enough clarity. And I, and I almost say that slightly sort of tongue-in-cheek but I say it because it came from a world which was so finite I mean not dissimilar to, to yours but you know the one unusual aspect about athletics as a sport is that it's so objective um, you know I threw an 800 gram javelin um, from a flat surface um, in a stadium you know 
in a sector that was 30 degrees, the grass was flat, no, things didn't change. We knew the date, the time, the venue, we knew the criteria under which we were going to be judged. We were told what to wear, you know, it was, it was so, it was so, you know, not, you know, unchanging, um, clinical, structured. very structured. So, and the, and the reason I present that backdrop is that I would also caveat by saying that most people, most of the people I competed against lost clarity because, well, actually, I don't really know why, you know, the Germans always got too strong. Um, they just love the gym, or it's get stronger. Like, well, you're getting so strong, but it's only an 800 gram javelin. You're not quick enough. I always beat them. Um, <laughs> You know, other people lost their way. They may be overtrained in the last few days before the competition. No, back off. You don't need to train now. The work's done. All you can do is get in your own way. So th there'll be nuances of, of things that people, their their, where their behavior didn't fit the clarity that they may have designed in their heads. And you kind of go, that's madness. And it's why I, I, I make such a point of it because in this ever-changing, strange world of change, where the environment's changing, the opposition's changing, the technology's changing, Joe, right? Yeah. How can we, we know, we're juggling this stuff and trying to you know, invent clarity. So I think coming out of this COVID thing is gonna be, you know, we don't know what the new normal will look like. I appreciate what you say there, Simon. But what I do know is the, the, the people who will thrive were the ones who will first of all embrace change, of course. They'll be the ones who make no presupposition as to what the future will look like they will see it truly through honest and open eyes um and and, and i think that they'll also um be, be sort of almost malleable to 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 work and 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 as it as it all unfolds to to change to, to what it presents and that flexibility with clarity is very tough especially with teams of course but where if one person's supposed to be doing a job and they go in the opposite direction because they've seen it a different way Wow, I mean, the team's all thrown and the synergy that we, we know is important in teams. And then we start going, wow, it's, it's too complex. So, so clarity, 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 almost on a daily basis for me is understanding, assessing, assess and evolve. Assess and evolve is, is the language we would always have used. Um, and assessing in a sporting tense, I, I appreciate it's a lot easier. But, um, I, I, you know, we talk about, you know, power through clarity. And I think it's the biggest challenge going forward, you know, we, you talk about five year plan and it's like, are we working four year plans um, because that's the Olympic structure, although it became five years because the Olympics been bumped <laughs> back here, but uh, no, nobody saw that coming. Um, so, but, but that now is almost possibly too far because of the potential for, for things to change in, on a you know, second by second basis, month by month, certainly. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to be a little bit, you know, bang on the drum about this one, but um, I'm quite keen for that sort of keeping the head up, taking it as much data in as we can to retain a, a keen awareness of where we are, who we are, what we're doing, what the next step is. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, let's go kind of approach is, um, is, what, is, is where the, the organizations that will thrive going forward. Sorry, I get quite passionate about that, but it, I really feel strongly. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree with you. I, th I think it's it's that adaptation, isn't it? It's it, you know, as an athlete, you're you're starting with a base, and then you're layering up the, your sort of athletic performance to build that robustness, both mentally and physically. And then you go through that constant adaptation to improve yourself. And in some cases, you might have to regress at certain times if you haven't optimized your recovery. But I think if you can get those, um, if you can get that balance of mindset, sort of. Um, mindset movement nutrition and recovery and find that balance to optimize your performance uh then you know at whether you're an athlete or or an office worker or a taxi driver or whatever you're doing uh to to to, to sort of live and earn your living is to use that same ethos mm. yeah i agree i agree wholeheartedly the, the the one thing i would add is clarity of what success is because you know for i think the the other challenge, and I think something we've all probably reflected on something that has been given a real shunt during COVID is to what success actually looks like for ourselves. And it is the first question I always ask in my sort of coaching work is, you know, what is, what is success? Because of course, it, it naturally will be different from one person to the next. And unless, unless we're 
clear for ourselves and clear with the team, we, 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 there's no way we're going to get that alignment uh, going on. And, um, you know, just wanting more isn't, isn't clear enough. It doesn't, you know, a level and a, and a finish line is so important. We, we, we know that. And also rewarding ourselves to get that balance that we've that we've discussed. So, yeah, it's we're unfolding a lot of um, performance uh, s- stuff here, Simon. I'm conscious it's um, it's a it's a bit of a a can of worms in some sense, but also one that I think coming back to that word clarity, that we need to keep it super simple. You know, when the environment can be so complex and unfathomable, you kind of go, oh, let's keep it really simple, and 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 decide what the next step is. And that's it. And then we'll take it from there kind of approach. I quite, I quite like that nowadays. I don't know if that's an age thing. Clarity, you've always, always been one of your favourite words. I've heard you talk about clarity so much. And the amount of times I've sat down with you over a cup of coffee and, and I've talked about success and you go, Joe, what is success to you? And it's just... <laughs> so, sorry, Joe. <laughs> coaching mode. It's okay, I get a free coaching session, so that was all right. But Simon's been doing some work with our team on goal setting, and I think you'll find this quite interesting, Steve. So I don't know where you get the, the layers of clarity and goal setting. So Simon will be helping uh, all of the individuals to look at their sort of short-term goals and then your long-term goals. Simon, tell Steve a bit about what you've been doing to help help our employees really think about those goals. Yeah, so I came up with this um, perform goal process. Um, So you take them through a sort of logical framework process um, where you look at your aspirational goals, what you ultimately want to achieve. uh, And then you go through your action goals and actually start to break down and understand the actual goal, you know, what what will build up towards those aspirational goals, those stepping stones. And then to clarify what barriers that you may face and what challenges that you may face, and then think about the solutions um, from that. Um, so what what you what will you put in place in order to overcome those challenges and then and then from there you clarify what your action goals are to work towards these aspirational goals and then you end up with your daily goals in hel- in the areas of health work uh, and uh, personal and then you set those sort of three goals a day so for example personal might be uh, that I'm going to read my son uh, a book uh, tonight on bfg whatever it is um, your work might be that you will achieve your deadline that you've been meaning to get done <laughs> on a particular area or you are looking to present and you need to get that done so get the work done in that area and then your health goal might be that you need to cut down on coffee and maybe supplement that with some uh, sort of water um, so maybe having one less coffee and two cups of water whatever it might be just to hydrate more effectively and then, and then the next day you set yourself another goal, another goal, et cetera. And then over time, then you build towards these aspirational goals um, eventually that you want to achieve. So then you have the clarity clarity uh, to, to understand exactly where you're heading and your journey and, and give you direction. I, and it stops that robotic way of living and it gives you direction in your life. Perfect. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. Very, very similar kind of model to what we would have adopted and, and yeah, the, the, the language we'd use is, you know, if you've got if you've got clarity in your heart, your head and your hands simultaneously, as in your why, your what and your how, and they're working in harmony, um, you, you, you're flying. And it's so much easier said than done, right? Because it's so easy to become a busy fool and react to the emails and, and get busy with our hands and, our, and the present and, and actually finish the day and go, have I made a step in the direction that I'm chosen, choosing to take? that's going to take me towards my um, aspirational goal. Um, and if, if the answer to that is yes, then great. And, it, and if it's not, then, then that, that, needs, that needs readdressing. So yeah, I love that. Great, great. Pre-empt, preempting, I, I guess, is a, is, a, is a key part of what you do and making sure that almost snagging the future, would you, would you have ever used that phrase in terms of preempting problems rather than waiting for them to come along and deal with them? Yeah, I think, I think prehabilitation um as part of a athlete's form of training to help prevent injury is is super important and and we can definitely use that same that same sort of principle and apply that to business i think if you could if you can forecast and see potential problems in the future and find solutions to help prevent that um i think uh, through the health and medical industry that works really well through physiotherapy uh sort of prehabilitation in that respect um, to help prevent in injuries and problems in in sort of athletes but uh, but also 
uh, for the office worker or the leader of business, um, I think that's crucial um, that, they, they, that they adopt that, that, that sort of way of thinking and that ethos, um, undoubtedly. So, so, yeah, no, I think it's really important. When we think about well-being, do you think as well leaders of the organisation obviously need to be role models for, for their staff because everyone looks to them? And even if you're thinking about, I mean, for example, if I'm not moving and I'm not keeping fit, that, that probably doesn't give great role modelling and I don't take any breaks. So, um, I mean, Steve, how, how have you been keeping fit? Because, you know, you like the gym and gym has been closed for a year and you want to be that role model to your daughters. What, what do you, how do you do that? Oh, uh, don't. I'm a bit weird, Joe. Um, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> so, I was telling Richard this. I, so I... At the start of lockdown, I invested in this crazy cycling system. Right. Um, Zwift. It's a, it's a, oh, I love that. That's yeah, brilliant. It, it's amazing. And, and so in February, I decided to... So one of the hardest rides is you climb the Alpe d'Huez. It's a, it's a GPS replica of the Alpe d'Huez called Alpe de Zwift. It's, a, uh, it's about an hour, 70 minutes, 80 minutes on an easy one, 60-ish on it. The goal is to break an hour for an average cyclist. I'm too heavy to cycle, so I'm, I'm at the slower end of that. So I went, right, I'm going to do it every day in February just, just to see what happens. You know, just, and it's horrible. Your heart rate's at sort of 160 for, for most of that hour. You know, it's a hard pushing one. You know, 220 minus your age, which should be your peak. I'm, 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 I'm right up there on where I should be. So, I, so my sister's a, a, a physio, so she's actually a chat with me, although she's just as mad. Um, but I did that every day in February. I, I did the climb just to see what would happen. I thought, I thought I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to feel amazing, and I'm going to march. I'm going to smash. I'm going to take on the world, right? Because we're locked down. What, you know, why not, why not make an investment? I put on weight. <laughs> I felt knackered. I ate for England. <laughs> I, needed, I needed to chat to Simon to manage the rest. I was eat. I was going to the fridge and just eating all the everything I could eat. I was so hungry because of the cycling. I was on the bike for hours every day. Yeah, it was tough, but it was. It actually was a real good insight. I'm not an endurance athlete, as you probably tell. Um, so it went against the grain somewhat, but but uh, it got me through February. Uh, as a plus side. <laughs> Yeah. Tell you about the time we went running together. <laughs> Go on. You know when I said to you that Richard's like he's either all. Oh yes. Yeah. Take off. Yes. When we went on holiday to France once. I said we were going to go for a run. You know, but Richard just ran a hundred meters as quickly as he could, and then just went home. Yeah, he's <laughs> definitely he's definitely more of a Usain Bolt than a Mo Farah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I know, a few miles. Hundred meters. He's done. <laughs> <laughs> but then he'd go again, right? <laughs> probably. He'd probably have, have a lie down for 20 minutes saying, that's that's what sprinters do. That's how they train. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, so, talking about fitness, we must talk about Tokyo. Obviously, you're known for doing commentating. I always get to hear your voice in the background if there's an Olympics going on. So summer, summer Olympics in Tokyo, I'm assuming you're not going to Japan. No, we heard recently actually the, the the commentary will be from Salford, so yeah, we'll be on the night shift on Japanese timings. Not quite sure how that's going to work, but it will make it happen um, yeah. as best we can. You know, it's one of those the athletes will be doing; they'll be so shepherded and 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 controlled. It's going to be very unusual mm. uh, for the athletes, but again, you know, it's the ones who are able to go with that. You know, similar to what we were saying earlier, the ones who just oh, I don't feel comfortable and then focus on feeling uncomfortable so you know competing in the championships is being comfortable at feeling uncomfortable and and there'll be more uncomfortable athletes in Japan than ever before not having crowds will feel unusual it won't feel real it will feel surreal probably um so it's going to be it's going to be tough for them we'll sit in uh, you know we'll be sitting in our various commentary positions and and um doing the easier job of talking about it um but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I just hope it goes ahead, Joe, because you know, oh, the athletes, yeah. you know, to have worked so hard and 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 you know, years of dreaming and aspiring, and you know, you, you get a very small window in athletics, especially where you might have two or three years where you're at your optimum between somewhere in mid to late twenties, probably. Some yeah, it's a little felt, wider window than that. Yeah, and if it doesn't sad. if it doesn't yeah. fall, you, you you know, the likes of Dina Asher Smith, who won in 
Doha 2019 world champion. Katarina Johnson Thompson won the heptathlon, beat uh, Nafi Tiam. You know, the momentum, you know, sports people talk a lot about momentum and creating momentum. And that momentum was, was halted. So the ones who can generate momentum, optimism, you could call it, are the ones who will thrive um, and, and, and stand strong under pressure. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very interesting dynamic, assuming it goes ahead. But the, as we stand, you know, putting 205 countries, whatever it is, into one country seems unlikely. If I'm if I'm honest, but I'm sure there's a there's a plan, um, and 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 I hope fingers crossed that it goes ahead and it, and it goes ahead without causing any further problems. Yeah, yeah, I might be a bit behind on my on my news, but you know I heard that Japan are quite behind on, on their vaccines as well, which 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 isn't great news. But I mean, you know, for some people, I suppose it's their first Olympic. For some people, it's their last. Like you say, it could be their last Olympics, their last their last chance. Uh, you know, at their peak fitness and. We we're very we've got some amazing clients as as you know, including yourself, Steve. And you know we look after some of the taekwondo team like Jay Jones and Bianca Ward, and we had them on our one of our team Zoom calls, which was brilliant. And I and I I wasn't sure if I wanted to ask them the question, but I said, you know, how are you getting on? How are things? Because like, you, like they still don't know if they're probably going, but but they had such a great answer. You know, they just said, well, we we train to to go and we train to win, you know, and that's that winning mindset that we've talked about today is, you know, all they do is they train, they train as if they're going, that's all they can do. And 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 the cliched line from sport is, and, and it, again, it's one that's easier said than done, is to control the controllables. Um, you know, there are things that you can influence, there are things you can't, there are things that concern you that you can't influence, let them go. And And, you know, one of the things that they can't, control is whether it happens or not all they can do is commit themselves so yeah there's a lot of theory that goes but of course you've got to buy in as we were saying about the goal you've got to buy in emotionally as well as your actions uh, and, and as we all know if it doesn't feel real it's very hard to make it feel real so I just hope that there's a sense of you know it will happen it, it, at the moment it's on it's happening you know so crack on you know at the moment it's full steam ahead um, and, and, and I think, um, you know, it, it will present challenges and I don't doubt that in terms of how the competitions unfold, but the championships always does. It's what I loved about them because people trip over people, a lot of people struggle with it because you can't do what you normally would do. And people almost, almost use that as an excuse. It's like, oh, well, I can't, I can't do it because I can't do, well, don't change, change it, do it a different way. You know, and there's a bit of a, a metaphor, I suppose, in, for COVID there, you know, is, is, is adapting and working with what we can, you know, influence and, and in potentially what we can control. I mean, that's the ultimate the stuff that we can physically actually control, let alone influence. So, um, no, there's a lot going on there. I just fingers crossed for the athletes. Um, hopefully we'll get a few gold medals, um, a few, any, any medals, you know, is, is something to cherish. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be hopefully a fantastic games. Yeah. And, and final question, Steve, I mean, who are the ones to watch, I suppose, from in the athletics world, who, who should Simon and I be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, look, I, I mentioned, um, you know, two there, watch out for, for Katarina Johnson Thompson. She goes in the heptathlon. She's the reigning world champion. Nafi Tiam of Belgium is, is her main contender, but uh, Kat showed in the World Championships in Doha that she can, you know, rule the world. And, and you know, we wanted to, to go on to bigger and better things. And, 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 and I mentioned also Dina Asher-Smith, you maybe add Laura Muir to, to that as a, as a trio of women. Um, on, on the men's side, probably not as strong, actually. Uh, um, you know, relays, we, we always come back to. Uh, potentially in the relays the middle distance is coming strong again so um yeah look it, it it's actually do you know what the, the strange thing to that question joe it's been such a long time you know i wrote a piece on this this morning to go in the metro you know it's been such a long time for athletes that they've actually been able to you know perform and you know do what they do best um we don't really know we don't really know what the opposition is capable capable of, and a lot of athletes don't know what they're capable of. So there's another unknown. Mm. So that that will make it even more, you know, nerve jangling, uncertain, and all that stuff that we love about live sports. So um, what what we do know is that Team GB has a habit of delivering 
when it matters. I think, you know, the statistic that came from the last Olympics was that was we were the first ever nation to build on a home uh, tally of medals. So um, 47 medals in Beijing became 65 medals in London, became 67 medals in Rio. And every nation prior, when they'd hosted the games, the next games, it, it fell off. We got better. This one's going to be a challenge, uh, undoubtedly, you know, but a, a medal tally in those kind of numbers would be would be amazing. Oh, wow. It is that British fighting spirit, isn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. It's in, it's in our blood, I'm sure, <laughs> to go out to win. Oh, it's been so great chatting to you, Steve. I'm so pleased that I was able to introduce you to Simon and you guys. I know you've got so much in common anyway. Uh, for sure. Um, Look forward to, to um, doing it all again with a, with, a, with a cold beer in a pub or, oh, or yeah. on, at, a, at an event or somewhere, somewhere, uh, somewhere maybe more uh, sociable. Yeah, well, with lockdown easing, we'll, we'll definitely get that in the diary. But thank you so much, Steve, and thank you, Simon, for, for, for hosting with me again. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, Take thanks, Joe. Yourselves. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Simon. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been brilliant. <laughs> thanks, guys.